Hello and welcome to the Spine and Nerve Podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Hovez. And my name is Dr. Nicholas Carvelos. And we are going to continue our conversation today on persistent spinal pain syndrome. But before we get started on our case report, just wanted to thank everybody for watching, for listening, for coming along with us on this educational journey. I hope that you're finding value. And if you are, please continue to share this podcast with people that you work with, uh, people that you're training with uh, to help us to continue pushing education forward. We really do appreciate you sharing and talking about the education that we're providing, the content that we're doing. Uh, It really does mean the world to me and to Dr. Carvelis when we hear from everybody and you're telling us how this is you know, either entertaining you in some way, I think probably less entertaining, uh, but at least educating you and uh, giving you another way of being able to learn about pain medicine as we continue on. But we are going to talk today about persistent spinal pain syndrome, and we've already covered uh, a lot of the, basically the definition, the pathophysiology of it, uh, and went into a couple of the more classic um, journal articles that have given us rise to this topic. Now we're going to walk you through a case uh, that Dr. Carvelis had recently. So uh, Dr. Kay, please uh, introduce us to our patient. Yeah. And uh, as Dr. Hovis said, you know, today we'll be focusing on the case presentation. So we'll, we'll talk about the patient. Uh, we'll discuss a couple of articles, uh, you know, that directly have to do with the treatment that was considered for this patient. And then uh, we'll wrap up with just some thoughts uh, from Dr. Hovez and myself in regards to the articles, as well as in regards to uh, this uh, specific uh, patient. So um, for this case, this was a, uh, a middle-aged gentleman in his 50s, um, uh, actually a firefighter, uh, relatively healthy, just some high cholesterol, but otherwise relatively healthy, very you know, active and motivated at baseline. Um, uh, he was originally presenting with chronic since uh, 2014 and worsening moderate to severe bilateral low back pain and right lower limb pain. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the cause, the etiology of his symptoms, uh, we were thinking it was a chronic uh, right uh, lumbar radiculopathy, uh, specifically involving the L5 nerve, that was based on his um, EMG as well as his uh, imaging and uh, and, and uh, MRIs in the past, and you know one of the big things we were concerned about in his case was because you know he was a firefighter who was originally injured in 2014, but really pushed through his uh, symptoms. the The original injury occurred because he was uh, carrying a individual from a building um, that was on fire and and uh, that's most likely when he you know herniated you know significantly injured that disc and ultimately the nerve um, but once he developed those symptoms he continued to work full time continued to fight through the symptoms and eventually got to a point where he was pretty debilitated and ultimately was uh, referred uh, to us so you know in this case we are again thinking about you know, not only do we have this radiculopathy, but it's a fairly chronic radiculopathy. His imaging actually did show, and I know we discussed about, discussed this when we were um, uh, first defining persistent spinal pain syndrome. We were talking about some of the pathophysiology that can occur, including that scar tissue formation around the nerves, but that doesn't only occur in the setting of surgery. It can actually occur in the setting of chronic injury and inflammation as well. And this was a good example of that because this gentleman did have evidence of that scar tissue formation around the nerve root. uh, And his symptoms uh, were, when he came in, were at that point fairly constant and chronic. And so, although there was some variability in terms of uh, what, you know, the activity he was doing and da- from a day-to-day perspective, but overall the pain was always there on some level. And that's re- when you do start to think about this uh, persistent spinal uh, pain syndrome presentation. So clearly, you know, by the time we, he got to us and also through our initial interventions, you know, he had really been focusing on lifestyle modifications. He had gone to a largely vegetarian uh, diet, um, continued to be really aggressive with his PT and home exercise program. Didn't love taking medications, but ultimately does take gabapentin because he does notice some benefit with that. But, you know, in the past had been tried on other medications without huge uh, benefit, even uh, tramadol and, and Norco, but ultimately didn't like the side effects and again, didn't have huge benefit with it. Uh, had obviously tried multiple injections, including with us, uh, you know, we still did try a transframinal uh, injection approach, but uh, short-term 
not long lasting uh, improvement with, with those interventions. So ultimately the decision was made to proceed with uh, neurostimulation, with uh, spinal cord stimulation. And um, we, uh, after you know, a shared discussion with the patient and all the different uh, treatment options out there, we ended up utilizing the uh, DTM or uh, differential target multiplex uh, spinal cord stimulation system. And uh, he had an excellent trial and uh, re you know, recently underwent the implant and is uh, doing well. And so obviously it's a little early on right now, but I'm very happy for uh, that individual because uh, you know they've obviously been through a lot dealing with the injury for a long period of time and now having some uh, fairly significant benefit. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, we want to point out is how you know we you talked about this patient having the injury multiple years ago, uh, you know, kind of continue to try to do what he could, right? The first step of everything uh, is, you know, being able to find the diagnosis and patient lives with it for basically as long as he can while trying to modify or, you know, work on some less aggressive uh, forms of treatment. But the thing that you brought up that I think we want to, I want to, to make sure that we emphasize was this chronic pain that never really goes away, right? And I think, you know, you can, you brought it up and I know we've talked about it in relation to uh, persistent spinal pain syndrome, but I think that's when things start to click for me at, you know, this is no longer just, you know, a, a, a disc herniation that when he's in the right position to put pressure on that nerve is causing problems. Um, there's something else going on, right? And so, you know, I, that's, for, one of the big differentiators. And I think as, when I'm working with you know, medical students or residents, and we're kind of trying to differentiate you know, an acute disc herniation and, or chronic radiculopathy versus somebody that's really crossing over into this persistent spinal pain syndrome type of presentation, that's one of the big things that I always try to emphasize as we're working through and seeing patients. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate that you brought that up. I just wanted to make sure that we kind of emphasize that because it, that is an important factor, right? I mean, if you have somebody that their pain never goes away, you know, it gets better and worse, yes, throughout the day, but it doesn't actually ever get to zero. That means that it's not just anatomic and there's something else that's going on that is causing all of these symptoms to propagate. And so we have to think a little bit differently. Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, in, in addition to the symptoms becoming fairly constant, you know, over the 24 hour period, the other thing that we've discussed in the past as well is the, you know, as that uh, chronification, the central and peripheral sensitization starts to occur, not just becoming, uh, you know, fairly constant in terms of uh, from a time perspective, but in addition, starting to become a little more difficult to describe and diffuse. Uh, from the patient's perspective. And so whereas initially they might have had very, you know, specific dermatomal symptoms, now it may be a little bit more uh, hard for the patient to pinpoint their symptoms and it may become a little bit more, like I said, diffuse. So, yeah. All right. All right. So, we, so you'd kind of talk through, well, you know, we went through the basics, you know, he, he lived with it, he exercised, he tried lifestyle modifications, he even changed his diet, which I think is pretty impressive. A lot of patients, I think that's a very hard thing to talk about. And we have talked a little bit about the, the diet of uh, trying to help with uh, chronic pain or the anti-inflammatory diets and such. Uh, we'll reference that in the show notes. Um, but this is somebody who did a lot of things, right? He went through a lot, wasn't getting the response that he wanted, eventually found his way towards spinal cord stimulation. You guys had a great trial. And now he's, you know, implanted in early on in the implantation, but showing uh, progress. So how did you guys get to the point of saying, okay, what we've been trying isn't working. You know, he's, he's getting to the point that he's not feeling he's making the progress that he wanted for his life. And then, and then kind of walking him through that step into spinal cord stimulation. Um, yeah. So I think that's always, you know, that's always a, uh, it's an important, sometimes uh, uh, can be, you know, depending on the patient can be a little more challenging transition in terms of uh, um, uh, the patient thinking about their treatment options, uh, you know, because it is, you know, even though a lot of these patients end up having, 
you know, some of these patients we're dealing with have had surgery and they have hardware in their, in their body. You know, the idea of another, even though it's a minimally invasive intervention, uh, the, the, another intervention with another device being implanted in them, that's, you know, a significant thing that they need to wrap their mind around and that we want to uh, make sure they understand as best as possible. And that's why I always tell the patients is whether you decide to do this or not to do it, I want you to feel very good and confident about that decision. Uh, so, you know, the typical main things I emphasize when we are starting to think about neurostimulation is emphasizing that we are, as you had brought up, you know, we're now dealing with a process that very much involves the nervous system and uh, uh, and to really try to target the nerves, we have to have a therapy that uh, has that potential. And, and neurostimulation obviously uh, is one of our mo more direct and effective ways to actually have a positive impact on the nervous system itself. Um, so, you know, obviously we bring up the upregulation in, in the receptors and transmitters, you know, things we've emphasized uh, uh, repetitively in the past, you know, and off. Oftentimes I'll draw out or, or show a diagram of this neuroinflammation, this upregulation in the nerves. And I, I think as we've discussed in the past, sometimes we, I'll use the example of phantom limb pain so patients can really grasp, okay, you know, this, this, this individual lost their leg, their leg is gone, but they still have severe pain in the distribution of that leg. I think that helps them to start to understand, okay, this is a uh, this is a nervous system issue involving the peripheral nervous system, the spinal cord, the, uh, the brain, and this is, you know, fairly ingrained at this point in time, and we need a therapy that can target that. And so he, you know, was very, fairly responsive, uh, ultimately to that discussion. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think you kind of set it up perfectly for us to kind of talk a little bit about for this patient, the choice that you made, right? I mean, you chose to go with, uh, the DTM, uh, treatment option for within spinal cord stimulation. Um, I think mainly because of a lot of the things that you just talked about, right? In, in terms of uh, the receptor, you know, up and down regulation, the changes that are happening at the level of the glial cells. And, uh, and side note, if you haven't heard Dr. Carvelis's rap on glial cells, please find a way to see it. Um, it probably will require you seeing Dr. Carvelis in person at a conference and, and asking him to replicate it, uh, but it's worth your time. Um, but can you kind of give us a little bit of back of the background um, that, you know, what has been kind of brought to light from a lot of the fantastic researchers in our field about DTM and how it interacts with those glial cells and therefore changes some of those, uh, you know, neuromodulatory cascades that you were describing? Yeah, so we'll, we'll cover, you know, a very important, again, landmark article here by Dr. Fishman and his colleagues and a, and a lot of awesome uh, researchers uh, obviously contributing to this, uh, including but very not much limited to Dr. Ricardo Viejo, who we had the privilege of speaking to as well. Um, so, and we'll also link his show in the show notes. Uh, he's fantastic. He's one of the uh, most interesting men in the world, but definitely within pain medicine. Um, we had uh, the great pleasure of, of speaking with him extensively about uh, a lot of his research. So please go back and listen to that episode, but we'll try to summarize it very, very quickly. Yeah, and so specifically in terms of Dr. Fishman's uh, uh, article uh, uh, pub published uh, fairly recent here, recently here in 2021 in Pain Practice, so this uh, article was titled 12-Month Results from Multicenter Open-Label Randomized uh, Controlled Clinical Trial Comparing Differential Target Multiplexed Spinal Cord Stimulation and Traditional Spinal Cord Stimulation in Subjects with Chronic Intractable Back and Lower Limb Pain. Uh, the objectives of the study obviously were to compare the effectiveness of DTM, spinal cord stimulation, and traditional spinal cord stimulation in regards to treatment of chronic low back pain and uh, lower limb pain. The primary outcome was low back pain responder rate, uh, defined as the percentage of patients with greater than or equal to 50% relief at three months. The other outcomes that they looked at in the study uh, included the mean change in low back and uh, lower limb pain, the responder rate, disability scores, patient satisfaction, uh, including at uh, 12 month follow-up um, time periods. The 
Results of the study, so ultimately 128 subjects were randomized across 12 different centers. Uh, 67 patients were in the DTM arm and 61 in traditional spinal cord stimulation. 94 patients un under ultimately underwent implantation with spinal cord stimulation. Uh, 46 patients in both arms, the DTM and, sp and traditional spinal cord stimulation, uh, completed the three-month assessment. And at that time, the low back pain responder rate was 80 around 80% in the DTM spinal cord stimulation group in contrast to around 51% in the traditional spinal cord stimulation. And furthermore, when they further evaluated that response, they found that in terms of patients having greater than or equal to 80% back relief, 80% uh, 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 improvement in, in pain in terms of back pain, the, that, that uh, percentage was 63% of the patients in the uh, DTM spinal cord stimulation group compared to only 28% of the patients in the traditional spinal cord stimulation group got that greater than or equal to 80% improvement in back pain. And those results were sustained at the 12-month uh, uh, outcome time point with fairly sim similar uh, percentages. Um, so, uh, and then just real quickly in terms of the actual VAS reduction. So the mean low back pain reduction was around 5.4 uh, on a zero to 10 uh, VAS scale for DTM spinal cord stimulation in contrast to around 3.4 for traditional spinal cord stimulation. And again, these results were maintained at uh, six and uh, 12 months. And in, in addition, they did find statistically significant benefits uh, occurring in regards to quality of life, uh, degree of disability, and uh, patient satisfaction as well. Yeah, and so obviously, huge study, um, you know, relatively recent that it's come out, uh, I think really has made another strong step in pushing things forward for our field and the industry um, to dive deeper into it. Uh, we had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Michael Fishman, and I think that you should, we will also reference that one, because I do think that you know, his ability to dive even deeper into those statistics uh, to kind of really hone in on the difference that we saw between this and some of the other therapies that we've used, seen in the past uh, is remarkable. Um, but how about taking us a little bit further into the theory of DTM? Yeah, so as we brought up before, you know, Dr. Ricardo Viejo has done an incredible uh, amount of work uh, and, and, and really awesome work in terms of the basic science behind this. And you know, one of the uh, one of the studies that he published specifically looked at an animal model uh, that was treated with either uh, uh, DTM uh, differential target multiplex uh, spinal cord stimulation in contrast to either no spinal cord stimulation or low or high rate um, spinal cord stimulation. And so, just as a quick background, I know we've talked about glial cells in the past, but um, cells, just cells, just cells. as a just as a quick uh, review, um, so you know, glial cells. And I think one of the things Dr. Viejo always emphasizes, which uh, uh, is an important factor, is that you know glial cells are so numerous in our in our nervous system. Uh, when you look at the brain itself, the ratio of uh, glial cells to neurons is fairly equal. And what's interesting is when you look at areas of the brain, for example, the thalamus, uh, that we hypothesize play a significant role in chronic pain processes and, and, and uh, pain processes in general, the uh, ratio of glial cells to neurons is actually, uh, there's more glial cells than, than neurons. And, in, and even potentially more interesting specifically for spinal cord stimulation is that the areas of the spine, the spinal cord that we typically target, uh, T8 to T11, uh, in that area, the ratio of glial cells to neurons is actually around 20 to one with glial cells outnumbering um, neurons. And so, you know, I think for, for all of those reasons, it's, uh, I, I think that's part of, you know, part of what um, uh, has driven this research to uh, further understand glial cells role in chronic pain and how glial cells are interacting with neur neurons and vice versa. Um, so uh, just real quickly, specifically in terms of glial cells, so as we know, um, they're in the central nervous system, we have uh, oligodendrocytes, which one of their main functions is producing myelin. We have microglia, which are the macrophages uh, of the central nervous system. We have the astrocytes, which are regulating those synapses between the neurons uh, and support, supporting and nourishing those neurons. So 
oligodendrocytes, um, uh, microglion astrocytes in the central nervous system, and then in the peripheral nervous system, uh, Schwann cells and satellite glial cells. And although we're continuing to you know, fully understand this, I would say there's a large body of evidence showing that microglia, astrocytes, and satellite glial cells in the periphery uh, uh, are playing a significant role in the, uh, the uh, chronic pain disease processes. Um, so when we think about that, because at baseline, these glial cells are so critical, uh, you know, some of their uh, functions include, but are not, li not limited to, as I said, uh, nourishing the neurons, regulating those synapses, uh, developing and maintaining the uh, blood brain barrier, um, uh, uh, as well as, you know, really maintaining homeostasis, you know, in, in terms of uh, fluid flow, ion flow, um, uh, the glial cells perform these critical, critical functions at baseline. When there is chronic uh, abnormal activation of the glial cells, when the glial cells essentially start to act aberrantly, um, there can be significant problems. Um, uh, and what we tend to see when we have chronic abnormal activity of glial cells is this manifest clinically as uh, pain sensitivity, uh, fatigue, cognitive disruption, uh, mood disorders, sleep disorders. And if that sounds like any patient you treat on a day-to-day -day basis, then you'll kind of start to, uh, you know, this is, again, this is further support of why glial cells are, you know, so important to uh, think about and, and when we're, when we're uh, 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 contemplating what therapies to, to offer our, play, our, our patients. Um, so specifically in terms of this study to wrap up that concept, and then uh, we'll go to our final uh, conclusions here. So essentially, uh, Dr. Viejo and his colleagues uh, published a study in 2020 that, as I had said previously, evaluated uh, DTM spinal cord stimulation in rat models that had a neuro neuropathic pain uh, 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 model uh, with a spared nerve injury. And they compared no spinal cord stimulation to low and high rate spinal cord stimulation specifically in that study was 50 Hertz and uh, 1200 Hertz for the low and high rate spinal cord stimulation. And they applied that stimulation for 48 hours and they assessed pain behaviors before and after the spinal cord stimulation. And in addition, they evaluated uh, RNA uh, from the spinal cord um, and they uh, evaluated the changes in gene expression, uh, both as a consequence of the neuropathic uh, injury and then as a result of the spinal cord stimulation. And so essentially what they found was that all three spinal cord stimulation therapies significantly reduced pain behaviors, including mechanical hypersensitivity um, however, DTM spinal cord stimulation had statistic statistically significant superior results in that study. And then even, uh, you know, uh, taking it a step further, what they found was that with the DTM spinal cord stimulation, when they uh, evaluated the gene expression, the animals that were treated with the D DTM spinal cord stimulation got closer to that naive non-injured state uh, in, in terms of the gene expression itself. And so it was a really uh, I think awesome study in terms of not only showing the um, the improvement in terms of pain behavior, but then actually correlating it with this change in gene expression and really advancing us in, in terms of continuing to try to optimize our understanding of what's actually going on at the basic science level with different forms of neurostimulation. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that's obviously a, a great reason for you to have considered uh, what you considered for this patient. And I think, you know, this research uh, that Dr. Vejo started and got uh, brought to a uh, clinical forefront uh, with Dr. Fishman has been, you know, obviously we've always talked about it, uh, it being such a big deal for our industry, but we've also seen just to kind of correlate this back to this patient, we've seen other uh, studies that have looked at, you know, treating persistent spinal pain syndrome in patients that have not had surgery. Right. And so, I mean, I just wanted to kind of fully circle back to that because I mean, for, for this trial, a lot of them were uh, patients that had had prior back surgery, um, not all, but uh, a lot of them did have prior back surgery. Um, and we chose to treat this patient 
uh, that had not had prior back surgery with spinal cord stimulation. And there have been, you know, a number of studies, um, you know, two of the ones that uh, come to mind recently, I know there was uh, a sub-analysis of the Senza trial, um, the, so the, the Nevro HF10 Senza trial uh, that looked at specifically the non-operative back patients. And then there was, I think, another arm um, uh, util that utilized uh, HF10 for uh, non-operative uh, back, chronic back pain patients, um, amongst others. I, I, mean, I, I know there was a sub-analysis of, um, of the birth study that also looked uh, at, at it as well. And so, you know, utilizing this therapy, utilizing spinal cord stimulation um, in these persistent spinal pain syndrome patients that have not had surgery is, is not new. Uh, it's something that, you know, has been well published and well documented at this point. And I think is probably one of the areas that is probably a little bit more exciting for, for us because we see these patients and we, I think we understand that you know, if their pain is, is there, you know, 24 hours a day, much like all of these patients who have persistent spinal pain syndrome, surgery is not always going to be the best answer for them. And so we have a, a lot of patients that do really, really well with surgery, but this cohort of patients, you know, I think there are other options. And that was, I think the point of bringing up this case was to show that there are these patients that, you know, when you've had seven years of pain, and it's consistent around the clock uh, and other conservative options have failed, spinal cord stimulation is a great option. And hopefully, ideally, we're not always waiting for that seven years of pain to kick in where it's really been, uh, had a lot of time to change uh, the entire cascade uh, that you just talked about. Thoughts to, to conclude anything? No, nope, that's it. Thank you guys. All right, guys, uh, we appreciate you listening. If you made it this far, uh, you're a better man and woman than I am. Uh, <laughs> but uh, please check the show notes for all those references. There will be quite a few and links to our prior episodes where we talk to much smarter people who hopefully can give you a little bit break of uh, breakdown into this science a little bit more. Um, full disclosure, I have spoken uh, for Medtronic in the past about DTN spinal cord stimulation, uh, and I'm currently one of the investigators uh, on uh, a trial of a clinical trial evaluating uh, this in other uh, patients. Um, and otherwise, please stay tuned for those legal disclaimers. We will talk to you next time.